If you have your scriptures, please take it and turn to the book of Romans. We're going to continue in our series of Romans chapter 8. And let's start with verse 18. Hear now these words from Paul. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that the words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. One time I took a group of kids on a mission trip to Birmingham, Alabama, and we were working at this church and we had to clean up this area. There was a, a lot of dead bushes and trees and, and there was bad people who used to come and hide behind those things. So the pastor of the church said, can y'all clear this out? And I said, sure, no problem. I had a bunch of teenage boys and teenage girls, so I said, we can make this happen. And there is a big tree inside there that was dead. And these teenage boys were trying to knock it over. I mean, they were running and hitting it and doing all these things. And of course, you know, I said, boys, get it down. And they said, it can't be done. I said, oh, no, you just didn't. And so I showed them. I went over and I grabbed that tree. I put my arms around it. I put my feet in the ground. I huffed and I puffed and I pushed and I pushed. And finally that tree went and fell down. I was like, ha, still got it. (laughs) Showed those young kids. I don't know how many of y'all have been to the deep south before. But in the deep south... Almost every large tree at some point is covered in poison ivy and poison oak. That night, I looked, and from my hands all the way up, my chest, my neck, my face, I was turning red. By that next morning, I had blisters all over my body. By that afternoon, those blisters were oozing. I was swelled up. My arms were twice the size as they were. And so I was, y'all, it was miserable. I was in pain. I wasn't going to show it in front of those kids. But as soon as we dropped those kids off and I got home, I told my wife, I said, I'm going to the ER. I got to get some relief for this. And so I walk in. And the first thing the the nurse does, she looks at me and she says, oh, hon, bless your heart. Y'all, if the nurse says, bless your heart, you're in trouble. And she looked at me and she said, don't worry, we're going to take care of you. We'll get you fixed right up. We'll make you better. So she came in and she gave me a shot of something and then gave me some cream to put on my stuff. And she said, now just wait here for 15 minutes. 15 minutes came and left, and she comes back, and she says, okay, go home. And I said, go home? I still hurt. (laughs) It's not gone. And she says, oh, hon, that was her favorite term for me. She says, oh, hon, I promise you, you will get better. But I'm also going to tell you, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Put the ointment on there, it will help. 
but the medicine will work. One day, you will be better. Trust me. And I went home crying like, (laughs) but that nurse did three things to help me. First, she told me the truth about my situation. She didn't hold nothing back. She said, it was bad. It was bad. I I did not need her to dismiss me and tell me, oh, it's not that bad. It's just poison ivy, you big baby. I was like, it hurts. She gave me something to help in the meantime, that ointment. But the most important thing she did is she offered me hope that one day it will be better. Y'all, hope is a necessity for life. You can live without a lot of things, but you cannot live without hope. If you lose sight of hope, you lose sight of everything. And the gospel gives us hope like nothing else. The gospel does not deny the reality of the situation we live in. It says the world is messed up. The world is broken. It's bad. But at the same time, it gives us some relief here. But the most important thing the gospel does is says one day... One day, all will be made well. One day, God is going to fix everything. One day, all will be made right. One day, Jesus Christ is going to return and everything will be better. It will be as it's supposed to be. You see, we've talked about how the gospel gives us forgiveness. The gospel gives us change. The gospel gives us a family. But one of the most important things the gospel does is it gives us hope. It gives us hope in Jesus Christ. And we need that. I love how Paul starts this part off. Look at verse 18. Paul says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Think about that. Our present sufferings. I love Paul does not deny that we suffer now. Life is hard. Remember, this is Paul. Paul, the one who was beaten. Paul, the one who was scourged. Paul, the one who was left for dead. Paul, the one who was shipwrecked. Paul knew suffering. But he says our suffering. One of the things that I do believe is one of the biggest blessings I get as a pastor is I get to walk with people through their suffering. And I tell you right now, in our church, we have people who've lost loved ones. We have people on the verge of death. We have people whose spouses' minds are deteriorating to where they are not the same person they were even two years ago. We have people who are suffering. And Paul does not diminish that. He does not say that does not hurt. He doesn't say that does not matter. He says, yes, it is terrible, but I want you to look over there. I want you to see what Jesus has planned for us. I want you to see what Jesus is giving us, what he has done for us. And when you look at the glory of God and all he has prepared for us, that, what we're going through here, pales in comparison to what is coming And so he said, don't lose sight. Our present sufferings are terrible, yes. But one day, it's going to be so glorious. One day, it's going to be so great and so awesome that your mind, your eye, your ear, nothing can even comprehend how great the things are that God has planned for those who call upon him. But it's not here yet. That's why Paul says, why, you, you can't hope for what you already have. But if you don't have it yet, you wait for it patiently. And that's hard. I want to be better now. I want the world fixed now. But he says, wait for it patiently. And Paul gives us a word to describe what it is like to wait for something like this patiently. He says, in the midst of this, we groan. Now, do y'all, do y'all know how to make a groan sound? <laughs> I think we do. I think there's one sound that best sums up what is life living, living in this broken, painful, hurtful world. It is groaning. Groaning means that Things are not the way they're supposed to be. They hurt. 
They're sad. They're depressing, discouraging, and we groan. Now, I would be amiss if I don't connect this to what we said last week, that as we groan, we cry out, Abba, Father, and he hears us. And so as we groan, we have a God who hears our prayer, who loves us, who cares for us, who knows what we're going through, a God who helps us at times, but a God who also says, I know you're hurting, but wait, be patient. The day is coming when all will be made well. But in the meantime, we groan. But what Paul says is that we are not alone in our groaning. It says that there's other parts of creation that groan. In fact, we'll look at that today. Three aspects of the groaning that we see around us. So I want you to grab your Bibles and let's go back to Romans chapter 8. And the first thing I want you to see here is the groaning of creation. Look at verse 19. Verse 19. Paul says, The creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. And I love this. He says, We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up through this present time. I love creation. I think things are beautiful. You go outside, is there anything better than a sunrise or a sunset? And I'll tell you, one of the things I love, I love to watch, I'm I'm a big weather nerd. I love to watch storms. And so I love being here in Texas now. I can see forever. I can see the whole storm out in the distance. I can see it coming. I was like, oh, that's beautiful. I love to watch storms, always have. But y'all might remember this, uh, December 10th, 2021. In Kentucky, there was a terrible outbreak of tornadoes. And we had a tornado hit about 10 miles from our house, the community of Bremen. It was an F4, I think it was an F5, where we saw the evidence. But y'all had destroyed that community. One of the guys in our church was an EMT, and the story is told about a mom who was in the basement holding her baby, trying to keep it safe, and the baby got sucked out of her arms and thrown 30 feet and died. So when I see a storm now, especially a bad, severe storm, I just don't see the beauty. I see that. And it's sad. And you realize creation is broken. We got natural disasters. We have disease. Have you ever thought about animal suffering? How much animals go through on a daily basis? One time I, I took a group of kids to Gatlinburg, Tennessee. And we were up there, and there's all these cars parked, and we're like, oh, wow, what's going on? And they said, there's a bear. We're like, oh, there's a bear. Wow, let's go see the bear. And we go over, and there's this bear. But then we hear, like, this noise, like a baby crying, going, ah, ah, ah. We're like, what in the world? And then as we got closer, you could see the bear was clawing at a baby deer. <laughs> and this poor deer was crying for help. And I had to tell the kids, turn away, turn away. <laughs> don't, don't look. Sometimes creation is cruel. And that's why Paul says here that the world is out of balance. It is in bondage to decay. It's subjected to frustration. Some of y'all's translations may say futility. What that means is that no aspect of creation is as God originally intended. Everything is impacted by the fall. Now, why is that? Well, go back to Genesis 1 and 2. Remember when God made the heavens and the earth and put everything in them, his response was, it is good. When he made humanity, he said, it is very good. But then God gave dominion over all creation to man. And so when man fell, everything he had dominion fell with him. Kind of like this. Have you ever saw Beauty and the Beast? Y'all remember Beauty and the Beast? It was the prince who messed up, right? 
The prince was the one who made the bad decision. He was the one who was mean to folks. And so when he got cursed, everything he had dominion over got cursed with him. His castle, his servants, his things, everything he owned was cursed. And the only way for the curse to be lifted on the castle was for the curse to be lifted on him. So y'all didn't know the beauty and the beast of the Bible story, did you? (laughs) But everything was cursed. So all of creation is tied, all suffering in creation is tied to us. Not necessarily by our action or inaction, but by our relationship. But it also means that its redemption is tied to us. And that's why it says in verse 19 that creation is eagerly anticipating or awaiting our redemption. When we get to see our fullness of children of God, when the curse is lifted on us, that is when creation will be restored. That's when creation will be returned to as God intended it to be. And that's why it says creation waits in eagerly anticipation for us to be saved, for us to realize our full adoption. And one day it will. When the curse is lifted on us, when we are redeemed, when we are as we are truly meant to be, creation will rejoice. I love Isaiah 55. This verse is just so wonderful. It says, you will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper, and instead of briars the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. One day, creation is going to start clapping and say, y'all finally did it. You finally made, you finally fixed this. And it's going to rejoice. But in the meantime, creation groans. But it's not alone. We groan as well. Look at verse 23 of our text. It says, not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we who are saved, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Now remember, we are already adopted. All the papers are signed, the payments made. We're just waiting to move in the house with God. But as we're waiting for that, we groan. And we are in bondage to decay. Now, our bodies are in bondage, but our spirits are set free. My favorite verse is 2 Corinthians 4.16. It says, Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Outwardly wasting away, inwardly renewed. Our spirit is renewed every day, but outwardly wasting away. I got to tell you, how many of y'all have, you know, saw someone you haven't seen in 15 and 20 years, and you look at them and you say, oh, you look so good. You haven't aged a bit. Y'all are lying. You have. We get older. Parts start to hurt. They start to make noises. Parts start to change colors. What doesn't change color falls out. We start to fall apart. Why? Because we're getting older. It's that bondage to decay. And we see it every day. And we suffer because of it. But it's not just the physical aspect. In fact, I would say that's the easiest part. The hardest part is spending this time living in a broken world. Seeing the ones you love make mistakes and let you down. Make choices that are bad. Hurt themselves, hurt you. And you just groan. You just groan out loud. Lord, why? Lord, when will this end? But the thing I love is that we're not alone in that groaning. Look at verse 26 of our text. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. 
There are some times you hurt so bad that you just can't find the words. You can't find the groan. You can't verbalize it. You just hurt so bad. And it's at that point where the Holy Spirit in you steps in and says, I got this. I understood what this verse meant. I, like I said, I, as a pastor, I get to walk with folks through some of the difficult times. And there was a, a family, the, the mother was in her 40s, and she had cancer. It was her second bout of cancer, but this time it just got worse and worse and worse. And she was on her deathbed. She had suffered, and she was, her body was ravaged with it, and she was in agony. And her husband, Mike, told me that the night that she died, he didn't know what to do because he knew she was dying, and he wanted to pray that she would not die, but at the same time, he didn't want her to suffer the way she was. And so he said he didn't even know what to pray. <laughs> And so he said all he did was just sit there at the bedside and cry the whole night. And he said he understood what this verse meant about how the Holy Spirit groans for us. But yet we groan, but remember, we're looking forward. We have that hope. And that's why I love, in verse 22, he compares it to childbirth. And this is wonderful because, you know, and I, I got to tell you, I'm a guy, so I've never given birth to a child, okay? Now, I've had flu before, so that counts a little bit. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but I know it is pain, it is agony, it is suffering, but there are two things that make it bearable. One, you know it's temporary. And two, it has a purpose. In fact, Jesus told this to his disciples in John 16, verse 21. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come, but when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. You know, when you think about this, if I show you a picture of my wife when, when, when my wife first gave birth, I, I didn't pull out a picture and said, here's my wife in labor. Look at it. <laughs> that, that'd be weird. I show you a picture of my wife with the new baby and you say, oh, that's so beautiful. You see, Paul and Peter both say that our troubles today are light and momentary when compared with what comes. Jesus here says, the day will come when your grief will end and no one will take away your joy. See, the gospel tells us that one day all will be made right. One day the sorrow will be gone. One day joy will come and it will never go away. I'm, I'm, I'm a big C.S. Lewis fan. And if y'all ever read the Chronicles of Narnia series, I hope you do. If you haven't, start reading. They're kids' book, but man, there's so much great stuff inside there. But in the last book, the last battle, how it ends, the kids, okay, spoiler warning, the kids died. <laughs> but it says they entered into this realm and it says that it's like you're reading a book and every page you turn is better than the last and the book goes on and on forever. But every page is better and gets better and gets better. Y'all, that's what awaits us. But now, in the meantime, we groan. So what's that mean for us? It means this. First of all, suffering is part of our earthly existence. We have to admit it. I'm not going to step here and tell you that your life is going to be great. It's going to stink at times. It's going to hurt. You're going to go through a lot of stuff. It's going to be painful. And you're going to suffer. But as you do, God will be with you. God will help you through it. And also, God gave you a family to go through it with you. Y'all, that's why the church is so important. There's going to be times when you're going to be so 
down and depressed and painful and suffering and you don't think that you can make it through another day, you're going to be so hurt that you can't see the hope before you. And that's when you need other people around you who will see it for you. When you can't pray, you need people to pray for you. When you can't lift your arms up and sing in worship, you need people around you who will. People to encourage you. People to say, the day is coming. The day is coming. And that's why it's so important to be part of a church. Second of all, as good as we have it today with our faith, it's only a taste of what is to come. Paul says the Holy Spirit that we have is just a deposit of what is to come. Uh, compared to this. Y'all, my wife is a great cook. Okay, she can cook. Oh my goodness, it's delicious. And oftentimes when she's in the kitchen and she's cooking, I will sneak in there and I will get me a spoon and I will open up the pot and I will dip that spoon in and I will just take me a little taste. And then she will yell at me and say, get out of here, you know, and all this get. But y'all, once I take that taste, put the spoon down, go back to my chair, I tell you, I'm still hungry. <laughs> but I've had a taste of what is to come, and so I'm excited, and I can't wait for the meal to come, because I know how good it's going to be. Y'all, it's going to be great. One day, we're going to look up. We're going to hear that trumpet sound. We're going to see our Savior return. And when he does, sin will be no more, death will be no more, suffering will be no more, no more cancer, no more Alzheimer's, no more pain. It will all be gone and all will be made well. Now, if you're like me, the question I ask is, Lord, why not now? <laughs> why not now? Why not today? Because that's how the Bible ends. Come, Lord Jesus, come. But you know the reason why the Lord hasn't come yet is for our sake? He's waiting for us. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says this. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You see, he wants you to come. He wants you to be a part of that. And he has saved you, he has delivered you, and he wants you to be there with him for eternity. But he's not going to force us against our will. And so he gives us that chance. Now I'll tell you one of the things. Beauty and the Beast, you know how the curse was lifted? <laughs> Beauty had to come and love the Beast. Y'all, is there anyone more beautiful than Jesus Christ? Is there any greater love than this? that a man would lay down his life for his friends. That even while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. You see, it's one thing for beauty to come and fall in love with beasts and then stay in his castle. <laughs> what if beauty came and loved the beast so much that she bore the curse, that she bore it in herself and then she died in the beast's place? so the beast could be redeemed. With no guarantee, the beast would return the love to her. <laughs> Y'all, that's the joy of the gospel. And that's the hope we have.